it is said that a properly constructed Giza style pyramid that is properly oriented on the true north-south axis can capture hidden energy fields that are normally unseen, untapped, and unutilized. These include unique magnetic energy fields, but also other forms of unrecognized cosmic ray energy field manifestations that impart life force or vril energy into plants and animals if captured and applied within the pyramid's energy circuit grid. In the 1970s, author Les Brown published a small book called The Pyramid, How to Build It, How to Use It. In that book, he explained a simple way to correctly calculate the base, sides, and height for any size pyramid that would match the ratio and proportions of the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. Following this formula, which employs the golden mean ratio of 1.618, the sides of the Giza Pyramid are angled precisely at 51 degrees. Quoting from Chapter 2 of The Pyramid, Les Brown explains, and I quote, The pyramid is built with straight lines of specific length and orientation. Using these proportions, any pyramid will function in unison with the natural elements that we enjoy, the natural elements that keep us alive and the world in balance, end quote. The word pyramid is made up of pyro, meaning fire, and mid, meaning middle. Keeping that in mind, let us take a few moments to listen to Les Brown, in his own words, elaborate on the importance of this mysterious shape. I, I put a little experiment together, and this is what I did. I drew a triangle on a table. Then I got three little tetrahedrons, which were... Uh, coat hanger wire, and they stood one here like that. Here's your tetrahedron here. That's a bad show there, but there's one stood here and one stood here. And here's the point of them. They're looking at each other. Um, let's put on the plane. There's one standing here and there's one standing here and there's one standing here. Okay? Now, of these three tetrahedrons, they're only about nine inches high and they were only made of wire. But the shape that I was talking about is, has an influence on it. The shape of those tetrahedrons uh, created a movement inside the, let's call it a pyramid. And uh, the movement itself started to cooperate with the other two. This one's talking to that one and that one. Now, I put a little wooden arm here. I'll draw it sideways. It's like a lamp post. A wooden arm, and this arm stuck out. And on the end of here, I hung a piece of string with a small piece of zinc, pure zinc, about two inches long, inch and a half wide, and a sixteenth of an inch thick. And I hung it here, like that. It's over here. stood here, and it's hung down there. Here's your zinc. So, between this, py this pyramid here and this one here, they are talking to each other, if you like. That's in simple terms. What is happening is that they send electrons to each other. You probably heard about um, Tesla's energy through, energy, uh, through, the, through the ether. These do it naturally. Now, the energy that was being collected into here I'll describe exactly how it happens in a minute. That these three pyramids are talking to each other. In other words, this one's sending energy to, it can't go to there, it goes to the nearest thing that attracts it. So the energy is shooting from here to there, and there to there, and there to there. Now anybody will tell you that zinc is a pure metal. It's not made of two or three different items, it's just pure metal. Well, I beg to differ, because after about three weeks of this bombardment going on, these were sending out electrons towards each other and hitting the zinc. Now, zinc is held together 
in proton form. That's way beyond the electron. Now, if you hit zinc, or let's, let's, I'll do with zinc, that's what I use. If an electron hits the zinc, electron can't come out. It wants in. The only thing it can kick out is a proton. So all these three were bombarding these electrons, and eventually, like it's kicking protons out, eventually the whole thing collapsed onto a little pile of powder here. A little pile of powder. And when I had that powder examined, it was a dirty calcium. Now, if you know the weights of your uh, elements, you'll know that um, off the top of my head, it's uh, uh, 65, 65 point something, and uh, four, I've got them here somewhere. There's about 25 moles per gram difference in the weights. Uh, 40 point something, I think. It's 40.8. I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. There was about 25 moles per gram. That's uh, molecules per gram in weight, at atomic weight. So if you took the same amount of each, this would weigh one, that would weigh that, and one would weigh that, because this, this one here, your calcium, was found higher up that scale on the lighter side than the zinc. That was farther down here. It was heavier. Now when I saw the difference that I had in weights, I tried to find something in the periodic tables that had that weight. But what had I, remo what had I removed? All I know was that my zinc had collapsed and I had it tested and it was calcium. I tried to find a number that would equal that and not even a combination of different numbers would give me that answer. So I had to look for something else. And it was obvious to me, really, before I started, but I just wanted to be sure, that what I had removed was energy. I hadn't removed anything you can give a name to, I had removed energy. So I put this in a little tiny bag, uh, with, uh, hung it on here, and I repeated the process. And believe it or not, after about six weeks, is longer this time, it got smaller and smaller and it changed colour too and all I had when I tested it was aluminum. I'd come from zinc to calcium to aluminum. And there's a funny side of this because uh, a doctor will say that um, you, you know you don't have enough calcium in your system. I'll give you some calcium tablets. At the same time, somebody says, don't cook in aluminum pans. It's bad for you. Uh, but when you get calcium tablets, there's aluminum in it, isn't there? Energy-wise. Not only that, they say, okay, get out of the aluminum and get out of the calcium. I'll give you some zinc tablets. They gave you all three. Because in energy form, like I told you when we first started, we must regard everything in its electrical magnetic form but you're not going to understand me. Reduce everything in your mind to the electrical and the magnetic, and I will give you numbers. You can work these out for yourself. If that's the weight of an electron, uh, you can prove it if you've got a calculator there. I know for a fact that hydrogen is 770 electrons. That's hydrogen, one point something. So if you take this number here and divide it into any one, of your elements on the periodic tables, you can find their electronic magnetic content. And so, uh, if you want to use, be able to use a crystal, would it not be sensible to have a look what it's like inside, and uh, what we can do, we move around in it, and um, <clears throat> find what spots do what. Now, I'm going to take you to this chart over here, chart E. And I've drawn it in the shape of a triangle because the molecules of your quartz crystal are pyramid shape, right down to the tiniest little molecules of your crystal, they are pyramid shape. So now, 
the, the one that I've just taken now, I've enlarged it, and I'm going to take you inside to see what it's like. Now just imagine yourself now looking around your new home. <clears throat> First of all, this little, this pyramid here would be no different to your big crystal pyramid. It's a series of these put together in a big one. Now, if you want to find the areas that are most useful to you, the functional areas, then <clears throat> there are certain things you have to do and abide by. First of all, I'll show you how to find the three magnitudes of a pyramid. When I say magnitudes, I mean, uh, if you in the house, uh, the heat at the ground level, floor level, will be different to halfway up and it'll be different again in the ceiling. We're not talking about heat, but energy rises and does practically the same thing. So now, <clears throat> what we're looking at is really uh, this size of this base here. If it's squashed up into there, whatever's in here, it has to get into a smaller place and become stronger. Now, to find the three magnitudes, or three divisions, never mind the intermediate bits in between, the three main ones. First of all, you measure the side of, if you could draw this on paper for yourselves, you draw the length of your pyramid, measure it, and you find the centre mark here. And you do the same here, and find the centre mark. Then with a square, put it on the side here, and draw a line in compass if it's like, and one in there. And where they touch, that <clears throat> you draw a line across parallel with the base, and you have the basic energy up to the first dimension, or first magnitude. It is multiplied there by 10. Whatever you had in here, 150 gauss I suggest is here, 150 gauss at ground level, uh, by the time it reaches here, it is 1,500. And <clears throat> where by the time it goes farther up to the top, it comes 15,000. But now we only have one dimension yet, or one magnitude. The second magnitude is found by measuring from here to here, the centre mark of it, halfway between the two, and draw a line across. Now you have dimension one, dimension two, or magnitude one, magnitude two. And each of these multiplies by ten. So that whatever magnitude you draw into the pyramid, naturally, let's talk about natural, not force-fed, whatever energy you draw into the pyramid would come out of the top a thousand times stronger. Now, <clears throat> this point here If, if I said to you, uh, you've got a, a, a glass pyramid there, like one we have here, where is the center of that? Where is the cube root of it? Well, this is the way you find it. Half that measurement in here, and half of this there. This is the cube root of your pyramid. It's an unusual shape, isn't it? It isn't like a cube, or even a, a sphere. That is the cube root of any pyramid doesn't matter whether it's uh, equilateral size or what, that will be the cube root. Now, what does that mean? Uh, the energy collects into it and condenses itself into a nucleus at that particular stage and builds up. That's the place where all your energy builds to. That's what it's going to be. Whatever you bring into here, it will congregate there. That's the cube root of your pyramid. Now. From here, halfway up, that's two-thirds, that's one-third, two-thirds up, you have the junction of the second and first dimensions. Here's your first one, here's your second one. This is the junction of them. Now, the energy from here will spiral up there to this area here. If it releases, it will carry on its way and go out. But at this stage, we're talking about magnitudes. This is the place where all your energy collects. This is your energy. This is your engine. This is your nucleus, the power. And that gradually spins and gets more dense into this area here. You will never ever empty that. You will never empty more than that rose to. You can't take any more than that. But as that empties, this fills. 
In other words, a cycle, you never lose the energy of that. So, <clears throat> whatever goes into here and leaves from there, if it's allowed to go, which it will do, uh, it takes a period of time for a crystal to fill. And from that time on, it has a, a time cycle. If this were, for instance, when I had my 30-foot pyramid, it took five days to fill. And uh, it didn't take me long to discover these spots in the world I could do some different things. It took five days to fill it, and took about somewhere about 13 or 14 minutes for it to empty here. But it did it on its own. I had nothing to do with it. It filled in five days, then in the evening it was usually 13, 14 minutes, and it released. Now remember I told you when the Earth received its energy into the North Pole, positive changed to gravi uh, gravitated to negative, and then went through and to the South Pole and threw it out as radiation. This here gravitates itself from this area here. I showed you the, the uh, spirals we were talking about on its way up. It gravitates from here to get this stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger, and eventually it will leave from there. But as soon as it leaves there, it is no longer gravitating, it is radiating. This would suggest to you that you would have to use the energy in a pyramid to receive a negative force. You could not receive a negative force after it is released. It has become radiation which is positive. Now, if you can imagine the, the 30 foot pyramid that I had, knowing that it contained energy and it's free flowing, it's always coming in and it's non stop. I said, well, why can't I harness this? Little crystals will do it. Why can't I harness a pyramid? So I made myself, I'll just go to the blackboard there and give you an idea what I'm talking about. I made myself two coils. One was uh, just a small one like this, and it was electric coil, counterclockwise. And I hung that in the top of the pyramid, but before I did that, it was, it was stove wire, and there's about eight strands of copper wire and stove wire, and I undid them and made them into a lot of fingers like this, spread them out, something like an antenna. And this end here, I just hung it up, fastened it up onto the beams, and that was right in the peak. Now I went downstairs, and I had a square piece of, a spare uh, piece of plywood, quarter ply, and I made uh, a magnetic coil with old antenna wire. It was double wire. And I put one end straight through into the earth, and so looking at it like this, uh, it stuck through there, and my coil is on here like that. And the other end I left standing up to connect. One's into the earth. Now, uh, all this wire here, uh, it's only quarter ply, and I used two inch staples. The staples went straight through the ply and gave me a better ground. This was also, this was also ground in the center. Now, there are many things that have happened to me in my time that I can't really explain. There are many things as I have known, but don't know how I know. And this is one instance where this happened to me. I knew I had to connect these two together with some natural wool, sheep's wool. Nylon was not what I wanted. And so uh, I, ha I got hold of some uh, ordinary wool, and I measured it out. I up the stairs, the stairs go right to the top. I measured it out so it hung from here to within oh, six inches of the floor. Plenty to fasten to that and to fasten to this. Now I stood on some, on some steps up there and fastened that to there, just wrapped around and tied it around. Simple. Nothing clever about it, just fastened it to this copper wire. And I hung this down through the steps, through the stairway, until it was hanging down. But it wasn't touching the floor. I went downstairs to connect this to that. And as I caught hold of that, it threw me 20 feet across the floor. I'm 180 pounds, and 
and he picked me up and threw me 20 feet across the floor. I got no skin on this elbow here and all down my leg here. And I lay there for about five minutes at least, wondering what happened to me. All I had done was touched a piece of wool. Now, this wool had gone through, it, it wasn't even connected to this, it had gone through my uh, cube root of the pyramid, which was about here, and up to the point, the second magnitude there, and that part was connected. And when I touched that, I grounded the whole damn thing, and it threw me 20 feet across the floor. I didn't know what had happened to me, and uh, the result of it was, I took the whole thing to pieces, I still have the parts, you can have them if you want them, and uh, I realised that I was fooling around with something I didn't really understand. My name is Robert Sepper, I'm an anthropologist, please find my published work on Amazon.com, thank you for sharing my videos. I appreciate the support on Patreon.com. Please don't forget to subscribe for updates, and I will see you again soon.